so thank you for coming to our talk on breaking the AI sound barrier. Uh, my name is William Jones. I am from Embercosm, and I'm presenting with Andy Thomason, who is from Atomic Increment. And yeah, I, and Andy's going to be doing most of the talking today, and I don't want to steal too much of his thunder by um, giving it, giving all the good stuff away. But fundamentally, what we're talking about here today is about optimization and about optimizing mathematical functions for for speed specifically. And our message from the talk today is really that the way this is being done at the moment uh, is not the best way it could be done. Uh, and the, the core of all of this is, is vectorization. Essentially, current you know, mathematical optimization libraries uh, or optimized mathematical libraries are not advantaging vectorization in the best way that they possibly could be. Uh, you know, there's many reasons for this. A lot of them were written before vectorization was really a thing. Um, even those that, that have been written more lately, vectorization is not always easy to apply to, to every operation. And if you don't approach the problem in the right way, it's not easy to do. And even the libraries that do both of these things right are very, very platform specific. They, they're very restricted in the, the scope of where their implementations will work. Um, and what we're presenting today is really a solution that, that solves all of these problems and then some more on top. So a little bit about us, um, starting with Embercosm, me. Um, so Embercosm is a um, tech consultancy. We focus on solving difficult problems at the hard end of computer science in open source. Um, and we primarily deal with compilers, tool chains, embedded systems, operating systems, AI and machine learning, with these latter two being my area of specialization. As for Atomic Increment, uh, I think this is where I hand over to you, Andy. <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you, William. Yes, so um, uh, my, my background's also in compilers. Um, I worked at Sony on the PlayStation compilers for many years, and um, I've done a lot of game development, and more recently working in biotechnology, um, solving um, statistical problems largely, uh, which is William's speciality. Um, so um, the, the problem as we, as we see it, essentially, is that um, most sort of AI machine learning libraries at the moment are built on uh, a set of building blocks, which essentially were made back in the 70s or 80s um, and really haven't changed very much since. Um, so in particular, there's a, a library called LibM, which is the standard C maths library. Um, it's got, you know, a little more accurate over the years, but um, that's, that's, that's really all that's happened to it. Um, and meanwhile, Computers have changed enormously, and compilers have changed enormously. And um, so, what we're what we're trying to do is to get uh, the get the the maths libraries to catch up with the with the compiler technology, and um, and not just libm, but sort of really anything which implements a mathematical function in any way, which is stats or um, sign, signs, causes, exponentials, those 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 kind of things. Um, so, uh, libm most recently has, has been focused on uh, accuracy. Um, and I'll explain Will's marvelous illustration in a second. Um, so um, LibM has been, uh, and most of the papers written on improving mathematical functions have been around improving the accuracy. And this is a, this is a useful thing to do. Um, and um, uh, no, how, however, um, uh, in the process of improving the accuracy, we've lost a lot of performance, and um, uh, and we you know, there's a whole whole load. As I show, there's a whole load of stuff we can we can really do, which really improves everything across the board. Um, so the the accuracy of um, LibM in double precision, for instance, is about sort of ten to the minus sixteen in the case of sine, sine, and cosine, for instance, and um, and you know. Uh, that's all very well, but um, you know, if you really, really, really want to measure the the distance between the Earth and the Moon to a less than a millimeter, which is what that what that precision gives you, then um, uh, uh, that that kind of accuracy is 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 good. But if if all you just want to do is calculate a sine or a cosine or an exponential quickly, um, then then I'm, I'm afraid you're out of luck with the current set of libraries. Um, they do, do 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 a fairly good compromise, but um, there's an awful lot of low hanging fruit which we can which which we can improve. But the reality is that no one's done no no one's really done this. They've considered this a fait accompli for the last thirty years, and really no one's 
take make any major improvements to um, mathematical libraries in 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 that time um, but no we've discovered there's an awful lot of improvements that can be done um, so just to kind of visualize the the accuracy this this is a this is a um, from Wikipedia, which is the the IEEE double precision format, and the, for the last five decades, they've improved that last bit on the right hand side. So now now that last bit is more likely to be right than it was fifty years ago, and um, so so obviously great strides great, great strides being made in the in the world of mathematical functions. And in order to do that, there's been you know tens of thousands of papers written on the subject and. Um, but all about improving the accuracy. Um, so unfortunately, while they've been busy improving the accuracy, they've been doing some bad things as well. So um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about table lookups, for instance, which is the current the current way of improving the accuracy. And uh, as we know, sort of memory systems are the slowest slowest part of a modern computer. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how, how we can avoid using table lookups as we, as we go forwards. Um, so while people have spent five decades looking at the uh, the, the mass uh, library functions, um, which kind of underlie, you know, NumPy and R and and all these things which people use very frequently, um, then compiler technology has come on a leaps and bounds, and and particular in the last year or so, then uh, GCC and LLVM in particular have made big strides in in um, supporting vectorized. Uh, architectures, in particular SIM, SIMD architectures, single single instruction, multiple data architectures. Um, now the the hardware has also improved remarkably. So um, uh, when he when he can do you know sort of back in the seventies when he did a calculation on a computer, unless you had a a cray, then you would do one instruction, um, or possibly multiple cycles, and you'd be doing one operation um, for for your one instruction. But modern computers can do absolute enormous numbers of, uh, of operations in a single cycle. Um, uh, so, you know, ADX 512 can do 16 floating point operations, uh, possibly even 32 in a single cycle. Um, the ARM SVE, which is a work in progress, um, can do up to 64 operations per cycle. Um, and uh, most, most modern GPUs can do very similar, similar kind of performance. Um, so um, and we, we save save an awful lot by give, making giving uh, a lot of performance to our ALU, the, the part of the computer which calcul calc actually does the calculations. So obviously, when you run a computer, what you wanted to do is compute and not just sit around spinning, thinking about things for a long time. Um, so the problem is really that LibM as it stands or or uh, or the other libraries like the R stats libraries and um, uh, and the the numeric libraries in NumPy um, really can't take advantage of these improvements in the compiler and the and the hardware. Um, so um, I think you now things have things have changed enormously since then. And um, uh, so there, there are libraries, for instance, which use which can generate which can uh, use SIMD registers, for example. But um, in the past, generating code for for SIMD was a very, very diff difficult thing. And um, so that the libm you find today is very much a scalar library. Um, hasn't really changed uh, for you know, say for the last fifty years. Um, it contains branches, which is very, very, very bad for computers these days. Really don't like branches. They don't like saying if this, do this. They'd rather just get on and do stuff, and um, you decide what it is you're going to have, going to select at the end of the day. Um, so, modern computers don't like branches. Um, and the other thing that the BEM uses, which I mentioned, is lookup tables. So, um, we can get slightly more performance out of our uh, accuracy out of our functions by using lookup tables. So, um, curiously, something we did way, way, way back in the the early days of game engines, where we we would kind of look up a sine or a cosine in a table. And then and then refine it. Um, so this is this is what the the, the current generation of uh, libm functions tends to do. And there's I can I can point a finger at a thousand papers which which have done this on each function in the in the in the maths library in turn um, over the over the last few years. Um, so um, there are vector libraries. Um, so 
uh, we have these, these guys, which are uh, vector libraries. They're all generally written either hand coded in assembler or hand coded in intrinsics. So using x86 intrinsics um, or neon intrinsics on the arm. Um, the, the problem with that is that um, A, B, um, uh, they're completely unmaintainable because um, in order for someone to make a change to them, they have to read through the whole the whole source base and understand that this cryptic thing means add add with carry to this thing, um, and you have to uh, maintain those things is virtually impossible. Um, uh, the, the 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 other problem is that they're very 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 machine specific. So um, those two at the bottom, for instance, one, one of them was SSE specific, and the other is AVX specific. What happened to AVX two? Nobody knows. Um, what happened to to AVX five twelve? Well, Intel Intel have been working on that one, but um, um, only only for Intel um, and uh, ARM customers, AMD customers, um, RISC five customers um, really won't be able to take advantage of these things. Um, in order to for everything to work in every language on every processor, then we need to we need to come up with something a bit smarter and stop doing all this stuff by hand. So. Big problem everything's platform dependent everything's hand coded which really restricts the the um uh the, the use of all these things and um and either assembler or intrinsics um very very hard to read so almost impossible to maintain so what we would like to do is just write c code um or write expressions like this and say um i just want this thing to happen i want to put this constant in and these this, this value x and I want to get an answer out, and I want that to be vectorized. So every time I do this, it's actually doing it on 64, uh, 64 uh, numbers. And um, I want to go tick, 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 tick on my computer, and my computer needs to needs to get the answer faster. Um, now, in these days, we're thinking very much in terms of the the power consumption of our computers. Um, so you know, Google, for instance locate their, their data centers up in the arctic because there's hydroelectric power available and um, and cheap cooling uh, particularly in the winter um so um very very much thinking of this stuff when you when you go and use a neural network or you go and uh, you know uh, do some speech recognition then you want this stuff to be fa fast and cheap and not to use a vast amount of power on your computer um, and SIMD is, is very much the way, the way to go forwards with that. You're consuming an awful lot less power um, if, if, you, if you get this right. So, um, in, in a good in a good in a good world, then that would be great. Everyone would just use less power. Um, but in practice, my experience is that as soon as you give someone people like this, they just use more of it, and um, they start mining Bitcoin, um, and um, and, and uh, the, the rest the rest the rest is another story. Um, so what would you like to do? Um, so in particular, uh, we want to make NumPy go fast because not because NumPy is the best thing to use, but because a lot of people know how to use NumPy. And um, the vast majority of users of HPC systems, for instance, tend, tend to use NumPy. Um, the biological world uses a lot of NumPy. NumPy is the mathematical library for, for Python. Um, uh, another big user is R. So if you are in the statistical world, then R is a very, very big use of high performance computing. So um, university R, uh, the university stats departments will always have a big supercomputer that can run a, a, um, a lot of R code uh, simultaneously. Bristol does, for example. And uh, um, another one is GNU Octave, which is the, the sort of open source version of MATLAB. Um, I expect they'll, they'll hugely deny that. Um, but um, GNU Octave is another thing that people use to to crunch numbers. Um, but what we would like to do is kind of do this on any platform, not just on Intel um, or even AMD, but on Intel, AMD, ARM, uh, RISC V, or any any new crazy architecture that someone comes up with. And um, in order to do that, it's got to be really easy for for people to do it. So the main tool in our armory when it comes to making stuff go fast um, and and with very little effort on our part in terms of we, we're very lazy at the end of the day um, so being lazy we like to just kind of write our code once and get it to run on multiple platforms um, so uh, modern compiler technology has this thing called auto vectorization and 
auto vectorization has been around for a very long time, um, but uh, only in the last couple of years has it actually started to become a, a very a very useful tool. Actually, starting to to um, be good enough to 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 use um, in anger in uh, in the field. Um, so some of the problems we have, for instance, is you you write a loop in your compiler. Um, the auto vectorization will convert that scalar loop, which takes one thing at a time, and processes it, and convert it into a, a parallel and a parallel SIMD loop, which um, will uh, uh, take multiple elements per per clock cycle and process them. Um, but the problem is that many auto vectorizers um, didn't didn't do auto vectorize everything, and there's still some reluctance on the part of auto vectorizers to to vectorize everything. Everything should be vectorizable. Um, with a with a modern compiler, um, and um, and as of sort of LRVM thirteen and the very last, latest version of GCC, then this is this is a lot more possible and um, so kind of and and the changes in the compiler have really prompted us to say you know can we do maths libraries a lot better or can we improve on um, all this nineteen seventies code which is kicking around? And you say to yourself you know why don't I just take the nineteen seventies code and run it on an auto vectorizer? Reality is, it, it really wouldn't vectorize um, it because it was kind of built in a day when CPUs were very different. And um, uh, at the moment, uh, we need to take out all those table lookups and take out all those branches in order to um, to make those functions work. And also, those functions have been customized for very specific processes like the the Intel architecture and the, and the ARM architecture. And uh, we we would really like a solution that works for absolutely everything. Um, so, we, so we, what we plan to do is to update all the mathematical functions in the world, essentially, at a single stroke, um, maybe several thousand of them uh, current, currently in use, and um, improve them substantially, um, but, but using a very simple system. Um, so auto vectorization you'll find in a compiler near you. Often it'll, it'll auto vectorize something without you realizing it actually happens. If you write a loop, in any of these compilers, in the very latest versions of those compilers, um, then um, you'll find it will probably auto vectorize um, as long as you tell it you're running on modern hardware. So tell your compiler you're running on modern hardware, and uh, the compiler will take advantage of it. So um, um, in the case of GCC, for instance, you need you need probably need to turn on fast math. You need to turn on uh, you need to do um, uh, tell it AVX2 is enabled or or AVX 512F. Um, and uh, compile your code on that, and you'll find the code generation is massively, massively better than um, than, than if you hadn't. And LLVM and Clang supported out of the box. GCC, you may need to turn on tree vectorize, and, and Rust supports it out of the box as well. Um, Rust being they sort of challenge a language to to C plus um, plus. So what we'd like to do is kind of have a, an easy way where we can. With very little effort, we can write um, functions um, like sine and cos and exp or uh, quaternion slur or you know what, what, whatever whatever comes to mind. We want to do this easily without without worrying about without doing a lot of effort, um, and and we want to know it works. We want to be able to test it automatically. We want to be able to um, uh, make it generate code in many different languages. You know C, Rust, C plus um, plus, Fortran. Uh, uh, OpenCL, um, CUDA, you name it. We 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 want Julia. We want we want to be able to generate code in those languages, which works fast, most efficiently. Um, um, so, in particular, what we don't want to do is do what these people will uh, thousands of papers did in the past, which is to run some code in Maple and then cut and paste the result into into C. Behold, we have a new paper we can publish. Uh, marvelous and. Um, so um, SIGPLAN is full of these, full of these papers, um, and uh, so we we kind of you know hope to kind of cut through about about you know a thousand papers worth of improvements in a, in a in a single in a single movement. Um, so so we don't want to do this partly because it, this introduces a whole bunch of random constants which we which then are referenced typically. It does, we don't ever see the Maple code which generated these these constants. Um, so, yeah. So we we need to be able to make templates essentially, which sketch in our functions. So if we're making sine or cos or exp, for instance, we'd like to make a template. We'd like that 
one template to work for many different sizes of, of number type or maybe even fixed point integers. Um, and um, we want we want the thing to be to be easy. Um, now, um, what we've come up with is a solution at the moment, which is based based on Rust. Um, uh, Rust is uh, has a lot of advantages because the you get a you get a sort of customizable compiler with with Rust called Sin. Um, and um, what we've done is an extension to the Sin library, which enables you to do things like numeric approximations. And um, so we've essentially built sort of the beginnings of a of a um, of a uh, computer algebra system for, for around Sin. Um, and we we need to be able to customize our functions so that things like NAND checks and so on are all optional, and uh, we need to to make them very simple. So as I mentioned, we want to generate it in multiple languages. Okay. So we've done this and our results are that um, we get between like, uh, for some functions, we get about 30 to 60 times speed up on the original scalar, scalar functions. Um, this is without using parallelization. So, so step one is to make the original scalar functions uh, run a lot faster. This is, uh, isn't right, this is only if they're in loops. Um, if you just call a function occasionally, it's not going to go any faster. The, the CPU, there's no way you can make that go faster, unfortunately. But, but if your function's in a loop, then we, we can do a lot better. Um, so if we combine that with, with, with um, multi-threading, um, then we often find we can go over a thousand times faster than, than the original function. So my experience of doing this is in the world of bioinformatics, where we, we speeded up um, uh, a lot of um, inference problems um, uh, Bayesian inference problems by up to a thousand times just just by applying this method to 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 the functions. Um, at the time, we we wrote intrinsics to make the functions go faster, but in a in a new shiny modern world, we're going to use auto vectorization to do that. Um, so our library is called Doctor Sin. Um, you can find it on GitHub. We have an organization. I won't put the URL in. Um, so the the Sin part is the the, the syntactical parser library we get we get with Rust. Um, Doctor Sin is because my family come from Dimchurch, and um, Doctor Sin is a is a character from a book uh, set in Dimchurch. Uh, it's a bit of a bit of a family a family legacy. So uh, just happened to work out that way. So it's a function generator library. How does it work? Well, we we write a template like this. Um, this is a template for exp2, which is two to the power of x, for example. Um, and um, the bit at the top um, is uh, setting up to to build this thing. This thing is is a code generator for polynomial approximations. This will build a polynomial approximation given given input function. So it it evaluates the input function to um, uh, in the case of doubles about forty decimal places, um, which needs to be quite a bit bigger, uh, quite a bit more precision than double. Double is, as I say, is good to 10 to the minus 16. So 16 decimal places are enough for double, but we, we use 40 just for, just for good measure. So our, our reference function is super accurate. And um, then we we um, run some code which approximates it. Um, I use a, in this particular case, I'm using a Newton polynomial. Um, and um, this generates a, a polynomial approximation of our number. And then I can use, um, the, this is sin, sin stuff, this quote, um, is a a function from sin, sin and quote are um, part of the procedural macro mechanism for Rust, um, and I'm able to make a pseudo function which is parameterized and generate this function in many 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 different forms uh, based based on based on the parameterization. So we have, for instance, parameters like e scale and one and the props. Uh, these these things um, are the variables which. Um, which, which change depending on the number of bits we're approximating, for example. Um, the, this is the result of generating that code and then translating that code into C. So, so in, in the library, we have a Rust to C translator, so we can, so we can translate um, the code into C. Um, I think C resonates with people a bit more because there's an awful lot more C programmers out there than our Rust programmers. But um, if we translate into C, then this enables us to do benchmarks, for example. So um, I won't show you the, show you the God Bolt, but um, on, on God Bolt, we can run benchmarks and um, try out different compilers um, 
on on their machines. It just so happens their machines are um, AVX 512 machines. So so why not go ahead and compile that for AVX 512? So if you pick, take that function and put it in a loop and compile it with the auto vectorizer turned on, then we get this kind of code. And um, these ZMM registers, for example, are 512 bit registers. Um, so each of these instructions does sort of you know huge amounts of work. Um, you know, 16, 16 multiply accumulates per per instruction. Um, the throughput of this is just is just phenomenal, and um, and uh, the, res the results uh, bear that out. So here's our, here's our our results. Um, so we uh, we run the same benchmark one one with um, uh, our DS thirty two exp two, which is our generated function, um, and the other with the libm exp two f function. Um, it's interesting actually that the compiler realizes that our exp2f function doesn't ever have an NAND because I'm, I'm just feeding in feeding in a, a, a set of numbers which aren't going to be NANDs um, and it will actually pick a, an, um, a, 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 no, a no overflow version of exp2f um, which gives, gives, it a, gives it a slight advantage um, however even with that advantage they take 4.15 nanoseconds per iteration and we take 0 0.32 nanoseconds per iteration I'm pretty sure we can go four or five times faster than that, maybe even ten, um, if we if we um, improve improve the code generation. So we're going to be working with um, uh, the LLVM and GCC teams to try and to try and improve that improve that code generation. Um, so that's about it. Um, so in you know in summary, um, we've um, we're working on a a function generator library, which you can give it. A variety of different functions um, and uh, very quickly generate um, with you know almost almost no effort um, not involving no external programs we can generate um, all of libm all of our stats um, and um, uh, a whole bunch of other functions besides and um, we're you know rather fingers crossed this this thing is going to take over the world of numeric computing um, in the near future as William will, will testify. Mm. So, um, is, is anyone uh, have, have have we completely confused everyone, or is uh, is everyone is everyone interested in that? Can you, can you ask me? If there's no questions for you, Andy, I have a question for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give everybody else a chance, though. Yes, I'll give you a chance to warm up. So, yes, yeah, so so William, uh, go, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, you, would you talk a bit more about how we can use this in bioinformatics? Um, to you? Yeah, so that'd be interesting. Yeah, so bioinformatics was the motivate, motivating factor for this. Um, so the company I was working for, Genomics PLC, um, they have a lot of genetic information, sort of terabytes and terabytes of genetic information. This, this is the comparative genomes of of you know, millions of humans, and um, and. Uh, in order to discover diseases, then um, we need to find out um, what what causes a particular disease, and the way the way we do that is to do what's called a GWAS study. We we um, we compare the genetics of millions of humans and look at what diseases they have or or will be having in the future. So UK Biobank, for example, is an amazing resource of genetic information, um, uh, which consists of about five hundred thousand people, one of whom is my wife. Um, and um, uh, uh, and about sort of ten, ten or twenty thousand different traits or diseases, you know, blood pressure, every, everything you can measure about a human being, um, by correlating the genetic information against the against the the um, uh, against the diseases, the phenotypes, we can attempt to work out what it is about your genotype which influences um, influences diseases. So we. Um, the big successes of this are things like the BRCA2 gene, which, um, if if you have the, the bad variant, then increases your chances of uh, breast cancer and, um, curiously, prostate cancer enormously. Um, so, um, uh, so it's worth you know. So this is this is a very a very practical application of all that. Um, and if we if we have particularly the EXP function is is massively influential in this and. Uh, for doing things like logistic regression and so on, and um, so we so we so we need to be able to do those things very fast. 
on very large data sets. That's excellent. If I could talk a little bit about as well about like in the, where we're looking at taking it at the moment is the, the finance sector, right? Yes. So particularly, so we've been looking for, for other applications where you want to run lots and lots of applications of the same function or lots and lots of applications of a mathematical function, a variety of them over and over again. Um, and the one we've come to at the moment is Monte Carlo simulation. Um, uh, particularly, we've been looking at uh, stochastic differential equations. Sometimes there are nice solutions to the stochastic differential equations. Sometimes there are not nice solutions, and you have to resort to Monte Carlo simulation to get a good answer. Uh, for which, you know, the ability to evaluate the same function again and again very quickly is extremely important. Thank you. Um, uh, you have a question from Chris Arthur's in the chat. Uh -huh, right. Um... Oh, it's a very good one. That's a very, it's a very good one. Yes, because you know, cur currently this is the primary use for a GPU is um, is to try and try and do these kind of problems. These these kind of problems lend themselves to GPUs very well. Um, so I, I, I have I have tried I have compared GPUs and um, CPUs in this particular case. Um, uh, so GPUs typically give if it, if if you compare this method against sort of GPU method, um, then uh, GPUs are still marginally faster than the CPUs, um, but it's it's like um, a few percent rather than rather than sort of few orders of magnitude. Um, so if you go out and buy a very expensive GPU card, um, then it can give you a give you a slight a slight performance improvement. Um, but the downside is programming the GPU is an awful lot more difficult than programming programming a CPU. So um, uh, you know, just uh, take you know, writing a program in the first place is 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 considerably more challenging. Um, uh, but um, you know, G G GPUs are just loaded with ALUs. They they do very little else. Um, and um, but with modern modern CPUs like the AVX five twelve, they're definitely quite competitive with the with the current you know, sort of top of the range GPUs. Uh, um, so. Um, just question of the software catching up. Cheers, Chris. Oh, thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, um, well, thank you, Andy and Will. Uh, I think it's a great piece of work. Will obviously works for me, so I have had some visibility of it. I think this is one of the most exciting projects I've been involved in for a little while. So, um, uh, thank you very much for your talk, and we look forward to you coming back and telling us about progress again in the future. <laughs>